being a cup of coffee. He did. I sat there and ate it. And he said, General, give me these eggs. I said, no, Sergeant did. General had that unknown to me. General had a case of eggs. He was eating. I guess he doesn't really good to do, but he had a case of eggs. <clears throat> we didn't have eggs. I ate the eggs and drank the coffee and the toast, and I was going to the bathroom from, from the, 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 the mess hall, the tent, what it was. And I thought I had to take a crap. And I hadn't got five steps out the door and whoop, I vomited everything I ate. I went on to the toilet and I just uh, never stopped, just go and go and go. And I was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So uh, I went back to, somehow I'm at the doctor. And the doctor gave me some pills to take some kind. I went down and lay down in bed a while and that fall felt better, got up and went on and I couldn't hold any meal down. Went on day after end. And <clears throat> uh, finally kind of wore it down, I guess, living with it. And probably the medicine helped a little on the way. And uh, so I had had that for some time when I got home. But I wasn't going to give up because I wouldn't had I known about it from the hospital, I wouldn't have got to go home. Mm -hmm. They had taken me off the list. And I couldn't afford to give up. So I just kind of worked through it the best I could. Well, you got to uh, the States and you got sick. Hmm? When you got back home, you got sick. Oh, yeah. I was sick at the hospital level work, you know. I don't know, in there two or three weeks. Yeah, but I remember you turned yellow. <laughs> right. Nobody will take my blood since then. I can't, I can't donate blood. Yep. And they said, well, you can try. I said, hell, I ain't trial. No reason to try. No reason. Nobody needs it. Mm. Yeah. I guess that's as sick as I ever was. Otherwise, I don't believe I was sick anymore. I got a little seasick the first day or two out on the ship. A little yeah. seasick. But, see, off 200 miles off the coast of California, you hit the water. Yeah, you told it. Pretty rough. And, uh, <clears throat> Finally, get over that. Mm -hmm. You have any regrets about the war? No. Feel good to go well, through it. Of course, is it? You were you were the lucky. Thing, thing is, I was sure was lucky. I, I but I I wasn't in any serious places to to get my ass shot off as many times as a lot of other guys were. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it could happen anyway, because yeah. uh, the uh, regardless of how many people. Every night, the Jap bombers come over dropping bombs. Fighters coming over shooting. And uh, you weren't just standing there open looking at them. You found to find a hole, a foxhole or something, while the raid's going to get in there. They've got it over. You want to survive. Is everybody wants to survive. Nobody stands out foolishly. They get under something or uh, nothing else. Get under a damn jeep. The bomb hits a jeep, you're going to go anyway. But uh, small ammunition, lots of my aircraft fire. <coughs> we one night, uh, Major uh, Sawyer rings a bell from San Antonio. Sawyer, I'm not sure if that's right. He had shot down about 35 Jap planes, and the general, the Air Force general, was going to send him home. He wanted to make one more flight, one more mission. And he had it tuned up where the anti-craft fires would stay nil until he got back down. Because he didn't want to get hit with shooting Japanese. He wanted to shoot another Jap down. When, uh, when the Jap, in other words, he's up there by himself. There's not 15 other pilots. Mm -hmm. He's going to any plane he sees up there, it's a Jap plane to him. And he's up there and, uh, I don't know whether they uh, got in a scrap or didn't get in a scrap, but any aircraft fire started to shoot him. Hmm. And they shot, not him, but they shot another American plane down and he's following the Japanese. He's right on the Japanese road, then they don't shoot the American down. And the, pilot, the Jap got away. American crashed out there a little further out. Now this happened. This is pitiful. 
And no, oh, everybody saw it at the airport, the any aircraft. And uh, they seem to take it on and on, shoot when you want to shoot, rather than follow orders. They shot this guy down right on, uh, uh, well, he, he was a plain dead-eyed dick. The pilot's right on his butt, he's going to, he's, he's letting it fire. He probably was hitting at the time. And they let loose that aircraft and shot the pilot and bing, just like that, crashing here. This happened. That probably wasn't the only time. But uh, everybody saw what happened. I saw it happen, just like other guys. Everybody was watching. I knew what was on. What yeah. He was He was not with this plane. He was coming in late on the mission, and he, he tailed his Japanese, and that's where he got shot down. But this other pilot that went up there, he had a, uh, another shot in Japanese. They were shooting stuff around him. And he came back down and landed. He didn't get a plane. He wasn't going to take the chance. No, no use him sitting there on our own anchor or shooting at him. They never got the order, or somebody didn't get the order. Somebody didn't get the order. Yeah. But he was in the United States. I think he had 35 planes, one of the top pilots yeah. uh, during the war. Uh, there was another one uh, <coughs> fighting, the same thing. I think about 33. And one day he went over Manila. This is a story. I wasn't there. He flew over Manila. And the Japanese have this little bit of light planes up there that just see someone dance around like this. Well, look, doing what they're supposed to do, but they, they're ducking, dodging. It's an airplane? Yeah, yeah. They were not fighter planes. They were there to try to entice the Americans to come in. And many times Americans went in, shot them out of the way, and got away. Particularly in the P-38. P-38s were terrific airplanes. I know someone thought it was better than the P-51. But the 51 came and it became the number one plane. It's a heavier plane, a little slower, but it, uh, when you got it going, it, it went. Uh, and he went up there over Manila, and you know it takes about 20 miles to turn this P-38 around. When you're going as fast as it'll go, and you want to turn and go back here, you're 20 miles down there before you can come back. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of guys don't think about this, but this is this is the truth. So. Uh, he makes a pass down. You make a pass and then get your way back and get back to where you can make another pass. And uh, they knocked down, they knocked down one time, they knocked down two of the two Jap planes. Other than the guys dance around up there entertain them. They got two Jap fighters that came in to get in the act. And when they did, they came back home again. They make a couple of turns and loops them back in, back in. You know, Rob has some movies of a uh, a series of um, cargo. I don't know C forty seven type series of one. Of so there's about must be half a dozen C forty sevens flying in formation, and you're shooting film out the window of the uh, uh, plane, and you got a, a formation of. Uh, I say C-47s because I don't. I think they're they're two-engine transports, and they're all flying in a big formation, going somewhere across a jungle or somewhere. Uh, could have been a parachute drop somewhere. Could have been in the states or was it overseas? No, 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 no. This is during the war. It's uh, could be New Guinea. It could be uh, the Philippines. I don't know. I, I we can't date it. I don't know. I'd have to see it probably. To bring it back to him what it was. But it's uh, included in the strip is uh, looking down at a, a river and uh, uh, there's some, you know, you can see jungle. It looks pretty desolate. It looks like it could be, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those places over there. I don't know. I'd have to see it. Uh, see if I know whatever it is. I'd have to see it. I don't remember. I took some damn many pictures in the air, uh, many places, yeah. and I uh, took pictures of, you know, when you're flying in a bunch of clouds and suddenly you come to break the clouds and, God, it's clean all the way to the water. Yeah. You're 20,000 feet up here, and here it's clean. It's like a break in the waves again, and then it's cloudy again. You've seen that, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm telling you, you've done it. You've seen a lot of it. Let's go. And uh, I got orders to go to... Uh, to uh, <clears throat> I 
I became uh, ESCOM's G3. ESCOM is the Army Service Supply Organization. We furnish the, the service troops. We provide all the food and everything for service troops all the way through. So now I got with the G3 of 3rd Army, and between the two of us, we worked out loading arrangements for all the troops from Solomon Islands, Sydney, all the way through New Guinea to move them up on certain operations. We were going to the Philippines. So I wrote all the orders for all the troops that were service troops, or at least I provided them to the 3rd uh -huh. Army to put it in his uh, order for the loading and everything else. I told them how many rations to take and I sent the other. And uh, we worked every damn night. We was working at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Every night we were sitting there. The one that sat there getting sleepy. It was a matter of getting the job done. But we had so many units had to have orders, plenty of time to be there, to know when the ship's arriving, what ship they're going to get on, and all that stuff. This is the planning for the invasion. All the planning for the lady. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> and when we got through that, I had my job done. I had it all set. Uh, I can, there's no way that I could go and watch the ship they got it all done. They had the orders. You know what to pick with them. Don't take anything extra. Don't load on much of us. Some of these units would build themselves to them uh, two wheel something or another, and just general because it's easy and helps with something else. Can't take it. They left a lot of stuff back. You'd be surprised what they can take. Army <laughs> wheels and so forth, make them a wheel bars and other things that had nothing to do with it. We had no room. That's all they could take, period. So a lot of stuff was left back. They couldn't even give it away. There's nobody to give it to. So uh, we went to uh, Lady. Well, where was the kickoff? Did you kick go? Kickoff was Hollandia. Hollandia. Right. Well, my kickoff was Hollandia, but many of the troops came from Solomon, in Brisbane, and all the way up. Yeah. And uh, all the uh, Admiralty Island, we picked some of them over there. And uh, the fighting troops, so to say, they had certain day they landing. Mm -hmm. Everyone. And where's they land, these service troops were with them. Yeah. So uh, when I got on, on board, we were rolling LSD, going into Lady, and that's where Mac Carthy said, I have arrived. You see, everybody's seen the picture many times. Yeah. Well, he took about three times. He walked back and forth so he could be sure he could plenty of pictures of him. <laughs> Walking that same thing. I have arrived. <laughs> so we had to. When we got all got got landed there, uh, there was a partial airfield, right? You land right in almost the airfield, and you're going to go around. The airfield's not too good, airfield's not too long. But it was used plenty because uh, if you took more room, you just land earlier. You might land a water or rice paddy, but you got to you try to get and come up with land. We lost many Navy, a few Fords, who just landed in rice fields. They couldn't get, they couldn't get to the little airport. They were shot down or got damaged. Probably set them down in a rice field, get out and get on the road, get a ride, bum a ride back, and leave the plane off. Three days later, they robbed all the radios and God knows what out of the plane. They didn't mind that. They put the tore them out, the tore them out. They didn't leave them there. So it was bad, just like shoving them overboard when they got damaged in combat. Yeah. Oh, when we got in there, uh, we had ASCOM headquarters, and we were going to move our headquarters in here. MacArthur hadn't arrived, and we had not moved in, but we picked the place we were going to move. And we were told about six, eight hours later, but we were not going there because MacArthur was his headquarters there. So we didn't go there. Well, now, I'll just tell you a little incident that happened at, uh, while we were in Lady. Mind you, we were, uh, we were getting ready to move again. Uh, I was, had gone up about three or four miles down a certain road over here, which was a road that we had to kind of go to get back around here to go back north again, which is, we're talking about 30, 35 miles away. Mm -hmm. 
And we had a long tom sitting over here firing about 30 miles ahead of us. Mm -hmm. They fired at night. Everything, every drop in the world tried to hit them. They never get them. Never got any of them. Um, I saw four FU 4 shoot down 12 job bombers overhead. I'm grinding with that little camera I got. I told you. Mm -hmm. I sent the films in to be developed and held duration. Duration was it took everything out except one plane coming down here. That's all. They had everything else. I, so I lost. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> one of the planes dived and hit the, the finance. We had an LST with the finance office on and all their, their people. One of the ships dived, Japanese ship dived and hit this ship. We had the, two or three other ships get hit. And uh, one crew uh, had a turret gun. Rear end the turret. Ship, the Japanese ship gun just clipped it like a and cut it all up. Mm -hmm. Cleaned the whole mess off. Uh, it's unbelievable, you know what I mean, that uh, one little plane can, that's iron and steel. It went through that, cut, and cut pieces to death, everybody dead, they were sold down. I don't know how they killed in there. Uh, the uh, war for the time being was in being fought in Lady, and we were having a tough battle. You remember the war that where Halsey took north and went to hunt, hunt the Japanese? What was the that strategy? all the old battle wagons down in Lady, and the gulf between Lady and Mindanao, the Japs came in through that, through that channel in there, and they were about to shoot everything out up here. That's when all the planes that they could muster, any kind, was sent up to try to knock them out of there. And by the grace of God, they did. Airplanes were... Uh, carriers were shot out from under them down there, and they were landing in other planes and uh, everything else. Well, this went on for, uh, well, all one day, and as far as I know, this fighting going on. And they got the Japanese out of there. And Halsey got word it's too late for him to get back down there. Because he's trying to catch the big boys, the big boys are down here coming in the back door. We had like 700 and 800 ships in there. And they would just had a picnic, and they were getting in there. But they, they fought them off and held them from getting all of them in there, and they locked them down one to one. And uh, that was quite a fight. So of course, I'm not in it. I'm with, uh, like everybody else, if there we're, we're listening to everything from the pilots, news, what's going on, and we learn more than that in any other way. And uh, so you couldn't just stand listening to them. You had a lot of stuff to do. Anyway. Well, that was the... Uh and Battle of Lady. Yeah, but you got the Legion of Merit. For... I, I got the Legion of Merit for all the work I did on planning the operation going into Lady. Okay. When we're at Lady, I'm going to tell you a funny thing. We had most of our troops in past, going past it and getting out of it. And in the rear, they got some uh, few service troops, a few police, and this, that, and the other. That, Stay till for the time being. One night, one of the colored boys was in visiting some Japanese girl. Not too far, but close by. And all of a sudden, about two o'clock in the morning, who comes in the front door but the Japanese? He sneaked through the line and came back to his wife, and what does he find? She's in there with a nigger. That nigger was so scared. He got a knife and chopped that Japanese to pieces before he could even shoot him. He whittled him to pieces and killed him. And then he got out there and run like hell, said, the Japs are here. The Japs are here. He hollered. And they had to chase that nigger, catch him there. <laughs> they finally chased back to what he did. He'd actually killed the Japanese, who would come back to see his wife, and she found her in the room with this nigger. Funny thing. Mm -hmm. But he was so scared. Well, that knife, I mean, he didn't have a gun in handy, he just took the knife and he whittled him up before the Jap could ever shoot him. Of course, the Jap probably wasn't expecting to find him there. And that's just <laughs> a no. thing. Uh, we had a 125 aircraft, an aircraft uh, shooting up in the air, come down. I've seen this place where they went, hit a Jeep motor, went through the top of the motor, and they discovered what's wrong. That bullet, it penetrated the top of the cylinder block. It's one in a million, one falling ahead of him, hit on a jeep. He might have hit somebody, but uh, he hit the jeep and even penetrated it. Hmm. 
I wouldn't have thought he would have done it. He sure did. But I saw the zebra. What um, uh, Rusty says that I should uh, interrogate you about the um, the sequence of the war, and that is the Japanese uh, generals versus the American generals. And, uh, I don't know what he wants. I don't either. Well, I don't think he does either. But uh, see, I have a little, a little war myself. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Everybody has his own war. He's got his own uh, things he's doing. It's a war to him. you got a job to do. And uh, uh, your job may depend on some others. It may, you or what others may depend on you, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. I, uh, this is where I detailed a major, the West Point major, that had been a, uh, out of school about two years. Going on a trip and make a mission down men now. Shot himself. That was a lady. He just didn't want to go. No, he didn't want to go. He's too big an important character. He thought he was. Uh, Action General. Was that common? Was that done often? I don't think so. I don't think so. It, uh, yeah. I only heard very little. As far as uh, committing suicide, I, I, don't, I don't know any other fact that uh, could have happened I wouldn't know anything about. But mm -hmm. That's the only I know about. Uh, <clears throat> He felt his, it was important for him to be somewhere else, not be where I sent him. There were only eight of them going down there, and uh, uh, nobody knew that there's that much danger and what they're going to do. And then, you know, you don't never know that sometimes. But when you send them down to do something, why well, you expect to be done? And so, then at the same time, we had an Addis general, Addis general, one of the units there. Now, what kind of general? Addis general. He was administrative. Mm -hmm. He was a major. He joined an air raid one night. The Japs came in and flashed over there. Uh, he puts himself in for a Purple Heart the next day. And Purple Heart is awarded by, you know, they, when they go through, he's in the big shot, and he gets the Purple Heart. So when the medal comes in, when he gets in there, uh, somebody said to some gentleman, who's going to present it? He said, what? So then he found out that his agent put in Purple Heart. How did he get hit? He got scared during the bombing raid and hit a hit a the bulb on a light and broke it, cut his finger, <laughs> and he put himself in for a permanent heart and got it. But the general took it away from him. So then he says, "Tomorrow, I want him shipped out of here back to the states." And he was. He was shipped out. But this poor major is going to get himself a permanent heart. <laughs> major. Yeah. And he wasn't in a position doing the fight. No, no, he's not, he's not in the fight there. He's, uh, he's the headquarters whether he uh, writes the papers, the orders, and stuff that it's told to do. I never will forget that. That's bad as eating breakfast. In the University of, of uh, Manila, just out the door, the Jap Dad Japs are outside the door. They got to run off there just before we had time to eat. And uh, it's Funny, you think, well, here I'm eating here, and the dead soldier right here, you are eating K rations, you know, and, and they haven't hauled them away. They just haven't got time. When the war's fresh, things are going on, uh, nobody's worried about calling somebody away. They're worried about getting the hell out of here in the south. And when we were down to, going across the Pasig River, MacArthur's Hotel, I was all sitting over here. Now, where is this? That's the middle of mm -hmm. We were going to the north. Pasig Hotel is... Uh, uh, well, the Passy River runs right through Milo. Okay. And the water runs this way most of the time. When you see it going this way, it's probably a Japanese with a big leaf on his head getting out. We're down there. I got a call at 11 o'clock one night, come down to a certain area, which is about four miles away from where it was. And uh, our lines were very rugged. And I'm G3. I'm supposed to, uh, you know, I'm with the, uh, we had a, uh, I wasn't in fighting troops then. I was the G3 with ASCOM, all this other business. And, but I coordinated everything with the, the three of the infantry. And uh, apparently 
they had, uh, I don't know how many, they had a bunch of 125s got banked from the side of the river, shooting across the river at the hotel. And the Japanese were shooting back. And uh, they had some problem down there they wanted me to do, and I don't remember what it was now. And I thought at the time, I said, can't this wait till the morning? I said, well, I don't think so. I don't think so. We don't know, we really don't know what to do. So uh, I said, I'll be down there. So yeah, I got it out of driver, and driver and I went down there. And we worked our way down the middle down there. and Into the middle of Manila? In the middle of Manila. And we were, we were right on the right, go working down to the river. And in fact, in nearly daylight before we got to the river. This, this is how uh, lots of troops, uh, nobody knew where they were going or didn't seem to they were in your way. And you're working way down, and uh, nobody knows who the hell I am. And uh, so, anyway, I go down there, and the first thing I see when I arrive, you may have seen it on the television. I've seen it on, on television. Uh, there must have been uh, 20, 25 Filipinos. There was one Filipino, hands tied, his head all banged up, and they were following and, and pushing him, shoving him, and then beating on him. Just beating This came on all the way down the road. Must have been, I guess I must have watched them 50 or 60 yards. Maybe no more. They walked from right down to the Apache River, and they was accusing him of being a spy. And they asked him, you going to tell, you going to tell, no tell, no tell. Put him right there. They shot him, shoved him in the water. When the water did him, he's gone. And that was the end of the expedition that they were on. Now, I saw that same film in a newsreel, some kind of MacArthur newsreel. I think I've got one. Robert's got it, and you'll see, you'll see somewhere in one of the films, uh, MacArthur's taking Manila or something, or they either got the same guy or one just like him, that they were hauling him down the road and beat him up. He didn't last long, because Filipinos catch one of the things, the gorilla. They, uh, you're the boss. He's a gorilla, you kill him. It's not something you have a trial. And, Oh, any kind of long run trial, if you're accused of being a gorilla, you, you're going to get it, uh, sure as hell. That's the way they fought over there. Mm. And uh, we gave the gorillas, when you think they're a gorilla, many things we gave them, uh, ammunition, rifles, guns. The only thing you had to do is be sure you're identifying a gorilla. And when you found him, uh, they were a little later, they were labeled and they had the uh, badge that they were. And they said, take it off of another one, but that didn't usually happen. They go in groups of three to six and we gorillas to tell you that. You want to see the badge? They got it. Uh, they were a lot of help, a lot of help. Uh, they could speak to uh, people that you couldn't, and so many things happened. But they were, they were working with the Americans? Oh, yeah. 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 The, uh, those that turned traitors did something that they weren't that they shouldn't have done. When the Japs were there, mm -hmm. they picked them off first. They started shooting left and right. They were killing left and right. The Filipinos did it. Yeah, they didn't. Uh, they cleaned house pretty fast. And some guys, I'm sure, got killed. Uh, maybe no, it wasn't. A, maybe he didn't help them. But uh, what they, somebody knew about it, he did help the Japanese somehow. And they wiped them all out of there. Uh, well, they got all of them, I don't know, but they got lots of them. But when we came down to Manila's uh, where they had that 24 thick wall building. And they were stalled up with Japanese in there. They're only 24 feet thick walls. Hmm. And they were trying to, they brought some 240 houses down there from, from 250 yards. And took a lot of rounds, knock holes in that, that wall to get through. And they got them all. They, they fired round after round in there, and that thing initially bounced off, and they finally knocked a little off, and a 240 house is a big gun. Yeah, and here they are shooting from close distance, uh, gradually knocking that wall apart to get through. And boy, when they got through there, they cleaned out every Jap in there. But that was they, that was one of the big hang-ups. That they were a lot of suicide missions left behind. Well, I don't know what you call a suicide mission. All Japs that way. 
We had kids that uh, Japanese hold his hand up. And they all rush up to me to get souvenirs off of them. Time to get they pulled the hand, they killed half a dozen. Americans killed himself to make any difference. That happened first cavalry division, more than once. And they kept telling them, don't make this mistake. If one holds his hands up, strip him. Have him strip himself before he gets them close to you. They always take everything off, strip, neck it. Shoot him if they don't. This is instruction. So uh, they 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 didn't mind losing their own lives when they were in caves and everything else. And we were blowing, uh, shooting. Uh, well, you know, I guess the worst thing that, that uh, they were afraid of fire uh, the the uh, flamethrowers. The flamethrowers, because that flame shoots out about 125 yards out there. And, you don't always hit the whole hole, we made part of it, but if it goes in there, somebody got burned. Well, I've seen rifles and so forth, they got, after they'd fired in there, they'd all bent and, and you wouldn't know it was a rifle hardly. Like, burnt so hot, it's hot fire. And uh, everybody was glad to have one of those things around to uh, scare things up. I never had one, I never fired one, but I've been close enough to see them Fired where the, uh, I know what. War's no fun. It's, uh, no, no. Sort of when uh, when you came back from the Philippines. Uh, the war was still going. Back to school? Yeah, okay. The, the, the war, war was still over. The war was pretty well over when I got back to the States. Yeah, but weren't you at Leavenworth? Weren't you all planning the invasion of Japan? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We went around the, down the tip. We, they had the whole thing planned. Uh, I see. I was eleven more probably, what six weeks? Oh no, no, eleven weeks. I bet eleven weeks or something. It was longer than that because yeah, I went to school up there. See, I was there. Uh, yeah, probably eleven weeks. <clears throat> when I got out of there, uh, I forgot what we had. Went back home. No, we were uh, we were in San Francisco. Well, well oh, you yeah, were going we back were, out. We went back home, home first. You then had to leave. It, then went to San, I had a week's leave or something. And uh, we were, we went back and then went to San Francisco. Yep. And when I got out there, uh, you know, I had wired, uh, I had wired the Adam General Fitch and I asked him since I'd been over there four to six months, I wired him to see if it, a lot of guys came home in two years. Why am I got to go back over there again? I'm worried about sort of, well, how I can't hate it. I've been over there more longer than anybody. I was with the first group. Here I am, I'm going back again, and the war's fast moving over. I knew that. And uh, see, Philippines had been finished, and we were getting ready to go into Okinawa and all up in the air. So I felt that I'd been over there, and I sent him one wire, and then uh, he said, first time didn't answer it, and then I sent another wire, and uh, I think I sent about three wires. And the last wire that I sent, I, I, they were going to put me on a ship. And I wired them and said, I want air transportation. So then's when they rotated me. I said, you're rotated. So I was supposed to report back to uh, San Antonio or uh, Dallas or somewhere at the time. And I reported back. No, I think I went, for, I went to I thought we Fort Bragg first, didn't I? No, 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 see, now wait. Because, see, we were, <clears throat> you were going back over. Yeah. And yeah. we had gone back out to San Francisco. Yeah. And so I was okay, then I told us going back to San Antonio. I thought the war was over back then. Uh, it was pretty quick. Because I don't. Five. Well, no, but I was, were you rotated before the war was over? Just about the same time or a little before. I didn't, I didn't see the surrender. I wasn't up there to surrender. That was yeah. after me. I was already back. Yeah. But I had come back, and I said to, first I went to Fort Sill. No, you went to Fort Bragg. No, Fort Sill, and then, uh, no, I went to Fort Bragg, Fort and Fort Bragg and sent me to Dallas. That's right. And from Dallas, uh, they sent me to Fort Bragg. I drove all the way to Fort Bragg, and in Fort Bragg, I stayed there uh, not very long. No, wait, wait, I was wait. sent back to Dallas. You, you went from... Dallas went to San Antonio. Okay. 
Because you went from Leavenworth to Dallas to Fort Bragg to Dallas. No, to Dallas Sanitone. first. To, uh, I see. I went. I was first. I was seen to Fort Sill. No, not Fort Sill. Fort Leavenworth. Well, Fort Leavenworth. I went from there to. Uh, may have been. I went to Dallas there and Dallas to to Fort Bragg. From Fort Leavenworth, I remember. You, I remember after Fort Leavenworth, you took a leave. And we visited uh, Texas and, and all. Went Louisiana. Yep. We went up to Fort Bragg. No, no. And then we went on. We went to San San Francisco, before, right after Fort. You, you were going back oh, over. Oh, I went back again. Yeah. But hey, this we're arguing I'm over. I'm after, after left San Francisco this time. Okay. I came back to Fort Sill or Dallas one, and from there I went to San Antonio or, or no, through you went San to Fort Bragg. It's I went matter. to Fort Bragg. Right. I went to Fort Bragg. Yeah. And I was not in Fort Bragg too long. And they shipped me back in to uh, Dallas, where it came from. Nope. I was in Dallas a short time. I inspected all the separation centers that they had in the area. Uh, I must have been there four or five months, maybe six, I don't know. And then it's in San Antonio. Yeah. And in San Antonio, they made me, yeah. a, initially they made me an adjutant general. And I was there not very long, but they picked me up and said, you're, you're going to be secretary of general staff. In the most areas. Mm. And that's where it was when Mama died. Yeah. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> from after she was buried, you know, you and I loaded the car yeah. full of all the final junk and stuff to load in the house, and I guess the suitcase must weigh 200 pounds of boats, screws, and everything went through them. Yeah. And we had both dogs with us. And we went north. But look, let's, let's not go into that right now. Huh? I want to ask what you knew about the invasion of Japan that was planned. Well, all I know is the plans that were uh, supposed to be made, and they had nothing to do with the Japanese surrender before we ever used them. I know, but what was going to happen? We were going to, we had, uh, on the southern island of Japan, we were going to land down there and up a piece up here. And, uh, what, you had in Honshu or in? in you know, Honshu. That's the main island. Yeah. We've had two invasions. Uh, well, we had planned initially for... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. But we... I'm the first one to go up. We had planned for something like uh, five or six divisions, initial landing. Uh, an army. And they take certain areas. And each one had a mission to catch an airfield and catch this over there and work their way through. And then as soon as that was going down, they had others that were landing further up. The time you got this cat here, then they'd land here and start on again here while these are recuperating them, in a way. How many people would have died? Oh, millions. Millions. Japs were ever in a crev every crevice up there. And they don't give up. They, just, they stay there on your shooting. <laughs> dying of them is nothing. It's like killing a hog. Who cares? You know? People are worship his, his uh, ashes. You know, ashes. He, had, he put some little stuff in a urn. Uh, very few of them was his ashes that got back. He was maybe been some ashes in there, but maybe served the purpose. But uh, they felt that if you died to your country, you'd go to heaven. Do you think, uh, what do you think about the atomic bomb? Well, uh, I, like everybody else, is glad to see it go in our favor. And the, the uh, way that it was done was <clears throat> out of this world. I know you saw a movie uh, that the introduction of that bomb plane carried that over and dropped it. You probably yep. saw it. Uh, it was up two. Yep. And that second one finished everything off. And it's unbelievable. People people can't appreciate you know, the ex extent of the damage that one bomb. Those are 20 megatons, I think, that were dropped. Yeah. I saw... Like 20 kilotons. Kilotons. Yeah. I saw three of them explode in Las Vegas. See, I'm, I'm uh, one of the number of troops that were sent to Las Vegas to 
witness, three of them explode out there. And I have a letter in my file now. I'm supposed to go to the uh, veteran hospital and <coughs> be examined, see if the, the bombs had any effect on me. And I told the head and general that I would go when uh, it was convenient. I'm never gone. I still have a letter. If I won't decide to go over there, I drop the head of general letter and, and they will notify them that I'm coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they've done, see, we had, uh, when, when before you whiteness, there you get a button that says, yeah, you get so many rinktums. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they ch you're checked before and after. But I tell you, it's, uh, it's something. You sit there and before they're going to fire, you turn around away from it, this way. When you color glass and everything, you're looking this way. And all of a sudden, the world is lit up in front of you. You turn around, about to turn around, and, and you look. And about that time, <clears throat> there's a wave coming to hit you, shock wave. And then you see all the stuff going around and around and around. It's taking more and more from the ground, and you just get bigger and bigger and bigger up here. And it's unbelievable the stuff that it picks up and carries up there, everything on the ground, it, it goes. And after, <clears throat> after this thing's gone, it's a way to help the honor. You're allowed to go up with them so far of where the explosion was. In our case, we were seven miles from where the explosion took place. Mm -hmm. And see, if ever bomb, they got a what's called a wife fork. They never know which way it's going to be. When the bomb goes, that will extend that further or than other places where it happens. So we would go up there and we saw where they had built a bridge, a steel bridge, blew the bridge down, uh, turned tanks over. Within about five miles, there was a small airplane was parked out there, tied down, and the concussion blew the windows down on the other side, not this side. It hit, blew one down back here. You'd think you'd take this out, too. It didn't bother this side, but everything's clean over here. Sheep that had tied in various distance away, dead. None of them were bleeding, they were all dead. Yeah. Uh, well, what, uh, you were obviously glad because it ended the war. Oh, yeah. And uh, brought the whole thing to an end. Yeah, well, it wouldn't end for a long time. If we had to go to Japan itself, and we'd been, it'd been a long war, and we'd lost millions of people. It certainly brought the war to a conclusion. Oh, yeah. Oh, Harry Truman did a good job. I always said Harry Truman was one of the best presidents we probably ever had. Why? In the top group. He had a lot of guts to do things, and if you don't like it, see me. Mm -hmm. just too hot in the kitchen and get out, you know. That's what he was. And I take my hat off. I think Harry did a good job. Well, go back. He said. No, wait, wait, you, don't you just go back and, and start with the, the business about when you went back over the second time, um, went to this is when you went to Tokyo after the war, and uh, what you know? You got the space. Yep, you're set. Go. Well, the second time I, I went to one overseas, I went to uh, drive in Tokyo, and as usual, went to the center, dispatched all the people to various places in the world, and. Uh, uh, the day I was told to report out to to get on the plane and go to Korea, I was uh, given the footlocker clothes that I was supposed to give to the Koreans. Well, I don't give them to Korea, I give it to quartermaster over there. And uh, it was the way that the Americans then were getting clothing over to the Koreans mm -hmm. without violating the law, so to say. You know, each officer carried some more clothing. So anyway, I was told to land up there and. Uh, they sort of called names of people and what in as they checked them off and told me I was supposed to report back to the bar, to the water room. I mm -hmm. thought the boy he said, Well, I'll tell you in there. I go back over there. <coughs> he says, uh, you're going to first scout vision. And I said, I'll be then gone, you know, and when to leave. That's up in Hokkaido. Yeah. We're down in Tokyo. I said, You're leaving this afternoon. He 
you got the schedule and everything, everything there. So I said, all that dude, go where it's supposed to go. Well, I flew into uh, nearest airfield, and the general sent general had the first cab division, sent his private airplane down and picked me up. In which I, I thought it was exceedingly nice, rather than riding a uh, truck or jeep somewhere that somebody picked me up that I didn't know. He had me at the headquarters, and he says, uh, the reason I call, call for you is says, you know Teddy Sanford? I said, yes, I do. He said, Teddy said you were one of the outstanding battalion commanders in the Eastern Airborne Division. He said, I got a division in the battalion that's not worth a damn. It's the worst battalion I've got in the whole division. And I'm going to give it to you, and I want you to just straight it up. And you don't have to follow anybody's training schedule except your own. You got on free, free ride for six months. And he said, uh, they've got more VDs, more AWOLs, and uh, more of everything else, fights in town, and, and uh, I could name it. He said, I want you to find it yourself and straight it up. Now, the battalion commander that did have it has been relieved of command, and I'm going to sign him to the uh, publication PDR or uh, the ad, uh, anyway anyway he is on public relations so he's in public relations I never I never heard of him didn't know him anyway and so well anyway he uh, flew me back down to the battalion area and he uh, sent word instructions down to meet me down there and who would meet me but the major the battalion executive officer who initially carried me to dump my gear, and I said, show him the show in the area. So he showed me around. And the first thing I saw was uh, about eight or ten prisoners. Men marched through the area, uh, one soldier in behind them with a rifle. And I said, who are these people? He said, general prisoners. I said, what are they doing here? He said, we use them. I said, you use general prisoners? They're supposed to be in the stockade. Well, said, we get away with it. I said, you're not getting away anymore. Before dark today, they get them back into prison. We don't want them over here. Any reason. He says, I got the okay. I said, I don't care who you got the okay. I'm going to run this, Major, not you. You either do what I tell you, or are you going to go out like some other people? So uh, we got rid of the prisoners. Now, the regulations uh, plainly state that general prisoners are not held in anybody's area. They're controlled by the prison department, the people that run the prison and so forth. So they were barring them out there to clean up the air, what they should have done themselves. Anyway, so I said, well, when do we eat? What time do we eat? And so forth. This is the afternoon, two o'clock, something. So, uh, uh, it's about, I told them after you know, the night, I said, eight o'clock tonight, I'd let you, you carry around and see what kind of guards you got. So that, so he carried me around to the various posts. <coughs> I didn't find one single soldier that had ammunition for the rifle was carrying. Some of them had M M1 ammunition and carbine ammunition. Others had carbine and a rifle with M1 ammunition. I didn't find one single one that had the right ammunition. And at various posts, <coughs> I said, Major, one of the jobs of the executive officer is to supervise the guard. You know that? He said, yes, sir, I've just been busy lately and so on. I said, no, I won't. You're not to blame nothing. And Major, I'll tell you what to do. Tomorrow, you report to General Coxell. Tell General Coxell that that new colonel that came in down there told you to report to him the next day. He said, what for? I said, you're fired from here. I don't need you. <clears throat> so. He says, I don't think you can do that. I said, you don't think I can. Try me. This is your last day of work here. Get through. So, next day, I called General Foxwood and I told him, I said, the executive officer over there is no good. And I said, I sent him back to the to you in the morning. He said, how many are you going to get rid of? I said, I don't know. He's the first one. I was, I was just ran into that uh, completely don't belong in the town. He needs to belong in the church or something. So, uh, he said, well, he is a halfway preacher. I said, maybe you can use him somewhere. 
So I had the leeway because the division commander told me, you've got free running. I can fire and hire anybody that wants to help it. General, the, 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 the brigadier general was the artillery commander. Can't override me because I'm back with the division commander, okay? I wasn't going to go that far, but where I felt that uh, these people don't belong there, I'm going to clean them out. I'll get some more somewhere. So I cleaned them out. <clears throat> I had a meeting of the whole battalion in the theater. Nobody in there but my battalion. And I put them in the blackboard up there. I had found out how many AWOLs, VDs, court marshals, this and that they had last month. Division has a contest uh, of all the units. How bad they do. And they have a hell of a ball of people that don't do very well. So I had uh, not less, of, I had 12 of everything or more. So I showed it on the wall. I had so many of them been having fights downtown. So I said, well, uh, anybody that don't want to be in this town and be a soldier, hold your hand up. I'll get you out in 15 minutes. Anybody. If you don't hold your hand up, I don't expect you want to be a soldier. And you're going to soldier. I'm not going to take in this stuff. The first non-com that has a fight going downtown is going to be the senior PFC the next morning at 8 o'clock. That very first Saturday night I was there, one of them had a fight. And boy, the next morning, 8 o'clock, I had his ass right in the office. And I said, Sergeant, did you have a fight? Yes, sir, but. I said, don't but. You are now a PFC. And I took a pair of scissors, clipped your sergeant stripes off, and I didn't sew the PFC stripes on them. I said, we miss PFC. That was the last one. I never had a fight. Then I took the, uh, I took him out on the range. And I had one howitzer, only one. I said, I want to have all the gunners and the sergeant up here, and we're going to demonstrate something. So we had one gun, and we set it on a target up there. And we put the aiming circle here and show them the target. I had them all take a look. They looked through the sight, this, that, another, and then we fired it. Well, it went right down the heart of the target. And now I'm going to show you something else. Here's a shot where he didn't get on the aiming circle. He didn't get on the, where he was supposed to be there, okay? Or he didn't bounce the bubble. And it hit way the hell away. Well, but it's fighting me. Right. Just demonstrating. But they found out that they were to hit it. If you put it on it, it'll hit it. Or you'll be damn close. So uh, we went out on a little further expedition. Watching the communication set up. And believe it or not, the guy had made a uh, bed up there out of wood, nailed it, and made a box up there here for a telephone to go here and tell them to go here and lines plug in here. And I said, well, the only trouble is it wouldn't work. I couldn't even talk to straight to the gun. The straight line, they didn't have in, but you had to go through his communication. So I had him junk it. I said, you went to Fort Sill, didn't you? Yeah. Did you see anything like this in the Fort Sill? No, sir. Well, we're not going to see anything like that here. We're going to follow Fort Sill's policy. They set the policy of the artillery all the way through. We're going to follow them. So you junk that. And we put a straight line from here to who we're going to do down here. We're going to shoot down there. And if I want to call him and tell him something, I want to talk right to him. I don't want to talk much of operators punching buttons and trying to find it and ringing bells and so forth. <coughs> so he sketched just exactly the communication supposed to put in. When the any time they go in, this is the way you do it, this is the way you do it, this is the way you do it, over and over again. Well, uh, I had a short arm inspection. Four o'clock in the morning. I didn't tell the general to tell nobody that. I had the MPs down there, doctors down there at four o'clock in the morning. Went through the battalion, whole battalion. Five batteries. Found 12 possibles, uh, four positives, and this, that, and the other. Hell of a lot of stuff. They made needle them behind the knees and the arms and everything else. And <clears throat> I got the names of all of them. And I personally talked to all of them. And I talked to the town about it. I had rubbers galore if they ever want to use rubber. And so you're taking your life in your own hands. And 
when they go to town, I put red scarfs on them. I'm the first one. I put, I had some scarfs made, paid them in my pocket. I bought, oh, I don't know, 100, 200, 300, I don't know, bought them, and we had embroidered cross cameras with 80 seconds below. And before anybody could go to town, they wore the scarf, clean clothes, shoes shine, and they looked like a soldier. And we were the, but they began to ask the gentleman, says, where'd you get the scarves? See, we had scarves and they just taken airborne. And none of them in the division had anything. You know, when I left the division, every single regiment, every company had a ribbon, or either green, whatever the color was, scarf with the stuff on it, the whole division. And they were dressed up like fit to kill. We had to have a parade and it was beautiful. When I had a battalion parade, they, uh, the gals come out, they were there, watch it and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> the general says, so where's the artillery? He, he made a, a policy in the division that everybody had a, 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 a scarf. It wasn't up to me to get them, but they got them themselves, just like I did. So. And they, about the third month down there, I got no BDs, I got no AWOLs, nobody in jail. I got some guys that are not completely cured of what they had, but I got zero, zero, zero. We had a meeting, division meeting. So the general artillery result, such such a battalion, two, four, three, and then we read of what, what he town did. Eight a second, none, none, none. First time in a year that a single battalion has gone scot free without something. So uh, uh, we went shooting after that, we got shooting. So we started shooting for trophies. Fighting with the other batteries. Between how long it takes you to go in. Now, mind you, I'm shooting, I've got the 82, I got the big houses. I ain't got the 150s. I got the big ones. So uh, initially, I had no tractors. I'm supposed to have 22 tractors, 24 tractors. I had two that run. So I pulled a buckle on them. I went and took those two out down there, some on one side, hauled all the other 20 down to the ordinance. And so the general called me and said, what are you doing? I said, I want the ordinance to fix the tractors. It won't run. None of these won't run? No, sir. You want to come run one of them? You're welcome. I said, <laughs> Everyone's inspected the ordinance officer. They found something wrong. The engines are no good in some. We've got to have some new engines to put these things in shape. And so he said, God, uh, I don't know how we're going to get them. It takes time. I said, depends on how bad you want them, General. How well you can get them over here. You can fly them over like everything else. And if you go after with the division command and tell him that the engines are shot, they're no good, you'll get them. If you go up there and petty us with him, you won't get anything like before. And I said, I'm not going to go out here and try and do a field problem with two houses. Well, first thing they called the ordinance officer. He was a lieutenant colonel. And uh, I asked him, I said, you ever work on these things before? He said, oh, yeah, lots of times. I said, well, do you ever fix them? Well, uh, I have a lot of trouble. And well, this all went through stuff. So they'd already heard my piece on it. What did they do? They went uh, to uh, the Happy Headquarters, told them to get us 24 new motors, fly them over and get them over immediately. Well, anyway, I didn't get them all at one time, but I did get them two, three, four, five, and I got priority on my let my tractor sit down there to put the motor in and run it good. Well, I was doing pretty good when I got 16. You know, it felt pretty good when he got to 20, 22. And so I had him sign me, an ordinance officer, to my battalion as the maintenance officer. Captain. So I told him, I said, uh, if you don't know how to fix these things, you better learn how. I said, I don't know how well you're acquainted with them. But you're an ordinance officer, you're supposed to know everything. I don't know nothing. You got free reign. If you find a one that's something wrong with one of them anywhere, anytime, you have uh, my authority to pull that thing out of there right then and either junk it or take it down and get it fixed. One of the other. 
I wanted to run, run, run all the time. Well, we started shooting contests. Finally, I got some houses to all stuff field. I won nine trophies out of 12. Nine trophies. Got a nice club and cup each time I won it. That's each month. If we run tests and find uh, how long it takes this and how long it takes that, how accurate it is, and this and another. And I had the sergeants. Sergeant, every gun that's set up to fire. You don't take the private's word that he's on exactly right. You go.